You're listening to the Generational Wealth Through Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Your host, Will Smith, is a former NFL player that found his passion in commercial real estate. Every week, you will learn from industry experts everything you need to know to get started investing in commercial real estate to build generational wealth. Thank you for tuning in today. We've got a very special guest lined up. We're going to be talking about some hotels. Um, but before we get into that, uh, if you're watching this for the first time, go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening on iTunes. And if you haven't left me a review yet, go ahead and leave me a five-star review on iTunes. Um, this is how I'm able to bring on rock star guests like I have on today. Um, but the housekeeping is out of the way, so let's go ahead and um, introduce today's guest. Today's guest is Neil Patel. He is the uh, owner, founder of Blue Chip Hotels. They own about eight hotels, uh, around 1,200 keys. And he's also an officer with the uh, whole organization. Neil, thanks for coming on the show today, man. How are you? I'm doing well, Will. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. I'm, I'm excited to talk about the hotel industry and... Um, you know, there's a lot going on with COVID, mm-hmm. but I know there's still some opportunities out there. So I, I want to really talk about that today. So, you know, if you would, man, tell my listeners, how did you get into the hotel industry? Yeah. So uh, my family and I, we moved from India in 2004. We worked at a small independent motel in Laurel, Mississippi for about six months. And then one unique thing our, about our culture is when someone moves recently, we always help each other out. And we were able to borrow money uh, without any interest from the community, from family members. And we bought a small and independent motel, 20 rooms in Giddings, Texas. Uh, And this was back in 2005. And up until 2011, we just had that one motel. And um, when we sold it, we used those proceeds for a down payment for a franchise hotel in Round Rock, Texas in 2011. And now we have uh, about 1,200 rooms in our portfolio. So that's how we got started. And I'm very thankful to our community, yeah. uh, which helps each other. And, of course, the association that I am part of, AHOA. Right. Right. And uh, used that uh, association as a resource because I was new in the industry, had no idea what to do. And when help was needed, I received that from the association and our family members. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... I mean, you, you guys, so from 2005 to 2011 and 12, you guys, you know, had that one hotel, it was 20 rooms and, you know, in a matter of eight years, I mean, you guys scaled pretty fast. That's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So when uh, we had the independent motel, I was still in high school. And then when we sold it, my brother and I, um, you worked every single day at the new hotel that we purchased. And, um, we used to manage it ourselves. We used to do front desk shifts. And the only uh, team members we had to help us were in housekeeping because that wasn't because someone was always uh, working at the front desk. And I also would like to credit the economy for Austin that went up in 2011. So we were able to increase our revenue from 850000 to about $1.8 million in three years. And wow. we were able to use those proceeds to buy another hotel in Dallas, Texas. And then that's how we continued to grow. And that was my true first acquisition, and uh, which turned out pretty well. And we'll yeah. discuss that in the later part of the show. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. That's, that's awesome. Um, so, you know, as somebody that's looking to invest in, um, you know, the hotel industry, you know, mm-hmm. how, how, how can they go about finding deals? Cause that's, you know, that's important, man. You got to have deal flow if you want to invest in something. Of course. Absolutely. So a uh, little bit about our association that I'm part of, uh, it's a nonprofit, um, or it's actually 51C3 for profit. And it's called a HOA, Asian American Hotel Owners Association. You don't have to be Asian to be part of our association, but you do have to be in the hotel industry. We have 19,000 members. One out of every two hotels in the nation is owned by our member. And we're growing day by day. Last year, a convention was in San Diego, California, and we had 9,000 attendees. So we have hotel owners that are there. We have uh, people who represent franchise that are there. And we also have uh, people representing uh, financial institutions that are there. So all in one place. 
So if you were to buy a hotel, you go to that convention, you find someone that wants to sell a hotel, then you have someone there at the trade show who can loan you or finance your deal. And then you also have someone who who you can put a brand. Um, So everything at one place. And that's what's unique about our association. And of course, uh, we also go through uh, brokerage companies like Marcus Milchap, CBRE, and so on. Those are the ones we worked with in the past. And um, But if you talk about getting into the industry, I think two or three months from now would be the perfect time to get in the in- industry uh, because I feel there would be a lot of facets coming to the market yeah. because of COVID. And, but you have to be dedicated to the asset. You have to be able to work every day if needed to, because this is going to be your property. And if you are successful and if you determine that you want to work every day, then you are going to be successful in this industry. Yeah. Now let's, let's talk about that for a moment. Um, I mean, because most of the guests I bring on the show, they are in the the multifamily industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times, you know, you could buy a, a community and, you know, you could put a property manager in place and, you know, your engagement with the property is primarily through the PM. And that may be Mm -hmm. once a week that you're talking to your property manager. Um, So, you know, in the, in the hotel industry, you you pretty much got to be hands on every day to to make it work. Of course. And and let me tell you the reason why Um, in hotel industry, the management companies charge anywhere from 3% to 5%. So if you look at your monthly revenue, um, a hotel is going to be much higher than a multifam. Because if you look at it, your average rent per unit is around $1,000, $1,100, depending on what the market is. Yeah. In hotel, you're looking at over $1,500. And, um, and that's just a basic room. There's not much um, that goes into that room. Like yeah. some of them may not even have a kitchen. So because the revenues are so high, um, your expense to pay the management company is going out of your pocket. So at the end of the day, depending on how much revenue you do, you, you may be paying over $100,000 to a management company. Well, that money can be coming straight to your pocket if you're dedicated and ready to work at the hotel every day. Yeah. And, um, and that's what I would suggest to a first time buyer who wants to work in the industry is work yourself and move up that way. Uh, For us now, we started doing the management company option because we don't have the time um, to dedicate for every single property that we own. And that's why we're more in acquisitions at this point. And um, we have our own management company and we have a team that helps us with operations for that. So, so you guys are vertically integrated. You're not going through a third party. You're doing it in-house. Correct. Correct. And we don't do any third party managements. Um, we only manage the properties we own. Yeah. And uh, that's been our model since we started. And I don't think we were going to change that going yeah. forward. Uh, what we will do is if someone does come up with the idea of third party management, we will ask or we will put down money uh, in the company to get a stake in the company or that asset. So that way we're attached to the asset. Um, And, and that's why I feel it's very important to be attached to the asset because you want to make sure you're doing everything in your power to um, make sure the property succeeds. And that's one way how we do our business. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, going off of that model there, then that means that you should probably be buying locally when you buy your hotel. If you need to be there every day, you need to buy locally. Absolutely. So we'll, one thing about our industry is um, when we first started, a lot of these independent or economy branded hotels, they have a home built in and it's connected to the office. So uh, when we first started, we used to stay at the hotel and, um, work 24 seven because if someone comes to the office, that's when you go exit your home and go to the office and rent a room. You come back to do what you were doing and you're cutting out a lot of your expenses that way. That way. If you look at owning a home in the U S you're looking at about four or $5,000 expense per month. Well, now that expense is going away because the hotel is the one who's providing you that home. So, a lot of it 
will be moving. So if you just do that, that's $60,000 a year that you could be saving along mm -hmm. with the 100,000 that we talked about for the management fees. Right. So that's hundred. Even if you don't make any profit, yeah. Um, that money would be coming or you'll be saving that much. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. You know, yeah. so yeah, it, it definitely takes a lot of commitment, man. <laughs> you got to get course. the wife on board and, and get the kids Absolutely. on board. And <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's definitely a big commitment. Um, now let, let's talk about uh, the, the different type of asset classes, you know, because you got A, B, C, and D of course. and multifamily. Okay. Like how do you guys kind of, you know, classify your, your um, hotel industry? So it's based more on the brands. Um, and then if you're falling to the economy segment, independent, then you have boutique, then you have uh, mid-scale, then upper mid-scale luxury and so yeah. on. So I think that's how our assets are priced. One thing that's different um, with the multifam and hotel is when a hotel is traded, you're, it trades anywhere from 10 cap to a 15 cap. And that's unheard of in your yeah. industry because when we looked at assets in multifam, you're looking at about five cap. Um, yeah. So the ratio is pretty high for us as hoteliers, uh, but at the same time, it's a lot of revenue coming in, much higher expenses than apartments. So I think that's where if you're hands-on with the property, that's where you can excel and cutting your expenses out. And if you do a lot of it by yourself, then that's gravy coming straight to your pocket, straight down to your pocket. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so tight, tightening up management is all that's going to go to the bottom line and then going to your pocket at that point. Of course. And one thing I would like to add is um, hotels normally, of course, the cap rate, uh, you look at that and it's a factor but mainly it's on revenue because we know how to operate a hotel. We do three or four times the revenue. That's a good price. Even if the yeah. cap is like, let's say if it's a five cap, yeah. that may not be a good deal for a hotel depending on the location and the asset class, but it may be a great deal because I know that how much expenses I can cut if I take in my management, right. like a hotel in Austin and a hotel in Iowa or Indiana, is not going to be much difference when you talk about the expenses. Yeah. The only thing that may be different is your labor cost. Everything else, the same supplies, the same franchise fees and so on. A lot of it is exactly the same. So we know exactly yeah. what our NOI or projected NOI will be going yeah. into a deal. So, um, so that's why cap rate is not that useful when it comes to hotel, um, right. but it, it does matter. But I yeah. think the revenue multiplier is the main indication of whether if property is a good deal or not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's good to know. So it's not, it's not weighed heavily on cap rates like most of the other commercial yep. real estate that's out there. It's, it's more on what, how much income can this property produce? And then, you know, throwing a, a multiplier on top of that. Yep. Absolutely. And, and if you, exactly, it's three to four. And sometimes four and a half, if the property is brand new, then you know that nothing, you're going to have a low expense when it comes to maintenance and so on. Yeah. And uh, one thing I would like to add is cap is important when you go upper mid scale or luxury because you're not running those hotels yourself. Yeah. You're hiring a third party management. So there may not be much difference when it comes to the expense. So, but in the economy or uh, mid scale hotels, yeah. You'll be the ones you have to assume you're the ones taking management of it. And therefore, um, it will be based more on the revenue multiplier. Yeah. Yeah. Now I was reading on CoStar, man. They was, it was talking about, you know, the hotel and in industry in general. And, um, it was looking at the occupancy mm -hmm. and, you know, it was getting hurt for the majority of the industry. But, you know, oh, one yeah. thing that stood out was like the, the economy type stays or extended stay type um, properties, mm -hmm. you know, could you talk about, you know, the reasoning behind that or why you think that's happening? Yeah, absolutely. So when you talk about upper mid scale or even luxury, majority of their business is not leisure. It's business clients coming to the area because their companies are working or have a client there. And that's different for economy or mid scale economy hotel, which we own majority of, um, your main clients are the ones passing by. They're driving somewhere. You have families coming to stay with you. So you're not relying, or construction workers, you're not relying heavily 
on um, someone who's coming or flying in for business in Austin, Texas um, to stay at your hotel. Yeah. So while that class is restricting travels, a lot of companies have travel bans. Uh, for economy hotel guest, that's not the same. Therefore, like our hotel personally, we're running around 70, 80% occupancy. While uh, my friend's upper mid-scale hotel or luxury hotels that are running five or 10% in occupancy. So that has a lot to do with your asset class. And going it or before COVID, uh, when you look at an economy or a mid-scale hotel, financing was hard on those because their economy or limited service. But now I think after COVID, uh, the financing institutions, they're now seeing that these hotels haven't lost much revenue or not much occupancy and they're doing well even in these times. So hopefully going forward, financing economy or mid-scale hotel will be easier than before. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense when you think about it that way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in the, you know, multifamily space, I use it as a broker to um, find mm -hmm. opportunities in North Carolina. Uh, what do you guys use um, to evaluate an opportunity as far as looking at metrics, uh, key performance indicators to uh, mm -hmm. see if a property is really, really valuable? What are you guys using for that? So for us, uh, us as a company, we make sure that any market we enter, it's more than 100,000 in population. Because um, when you look at small cities, they don't have uh, many demand generators. So if, it, if it's a town of more than 100,000, you know that there's, there is going to be multiple ways that revenue will be coming in. So you don't want to put all, or you don't want to base everything on that one piece of business. Because if that business goes away, your hotel has to shut down. So you have to make sure multiple uh, revenue generating um, that you can get multiple demand generators in the area. For us, uh, universities market uh, where they have colleges or schools, you know, those are never going to go down. Yeah. And uh, also hospitals uh, and medical centers. Uh, those are the two main ones even if it may be down right now, but it's always going to come back up. So right. those are the two that you look at. And of course, what your competition is, how many other hotels are you competing with and what brands they are and yeah. what segment they fall under. If there's 10 hotels that are upper mid scale or luxury and only one economy hotel, of course you want to buy that economy hotel because you're not competing with anyone and you right. have a different clientele that comes to you. Um, so that also matters. And, um, but you also want to make sure main thing is how big that town is that you're buying that asset in. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, if, if you could, man, could you speak on, you know, how you guys are able to track like the, the average rents or the average daily rates? Like what, what, what system are you guys using to, to kind of get those numbers? I think it's more based on supply and demand and also knowing what your breaking point is. And once you know that, then anything on top is gravy. So we do have a revenue management team that looks at the rates maybe like 15 times a day to make sure that you're not missing anything out. Because when you increase the rate by $5, the expenses is not going up because that $5 is coming straight to your pocket. Because every expense that we have when a guest checks in remains the exact same. It doesn't matter how much they pay. Yeah. So if we can maximize on what we can get from a guest, that money comes straight to our pocket. So that's very important uh, to know what your break even, of course, what your break even is at this yeah. point. And a lot of our majority of our costs are variable costs. But there's also a lot of fixed costs, for example, your mortgage, insurance, property taxes, and so on. So you also have to factor that in. Yeah. And um, once you know that, then you know, or yeah, you'll find success in the industry. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Now, there, there's, a, um, there's a company out there uh, that the hotel industry uses called, uh, is, uh, was it, is it Star Reports? Is that yes, one? Star. Uh, absolutely. So that's um, a big factor when we purchase a hotel. 
because what the star does or str report is it tells you what your competition is doing in the same exact market so for example if a hotel or if a area is averaging 80 percent in occupancy and the hotel you're buying is only doing 50 then you know that there is room for improvement there right that if you come in and if you do the right management you may not go all the way up to 80, but even if you get 70, that's 20% increase on your occupancy. Right. But now if you flip the tables, um, if the if hotel you're buying does 80%, well, everyone else is doing 50, you know that there's not much improvement that you can do to increase that because yeah. you're already at its peak. Uh, there's not much you can do to increase that. The only thing you can do or the property may do is the occupancy may go down. Right. Uh, because of several factors that go in. So STR report is very helpful when you look at a deal to find out if it's a good deal or not. And um, like sometimes we, us personally, we've paid more than four and a half, even five times the revenue because a property that we were looking at was doing 30% in occupancy while the competition was doing 70%. Yeah. So we knew that there was room for improvement and that's why we were able to pay more than what the property was worth at that time. Yeah. So now, you all, honest, yeah. No, I just wanted to ask you, you know, when you're looking at that and you, and you see, Hey, this one is at 30%, you know, how, what are you guys looking for to say, okay, how, how can you add the value to it where you can get the occupancy up? You know, is it a value add strategy where you renovate? Yeah. Or what are you guys doing? So renovation is key. And then also you have to look at their staffing structure. So the property we're looking at, it only did 30%. When we looked at it closely, uh, we were able to find out the property doesn't even have a GM. There was a GM on paper, but that GM lived three hours away and yeah. only came to the hotel once a week. Right. So you know that simple changes like that, where you can have a property uh, GM, uh, that's there every single day. It's going to help. Um, then you also need someone in sales. The property did not have anyone in sales. And of course, um, after renovating and rebranding the hotel, uh, we felt that this hotel was more of mid scale. And if we, or upper mid scale, and if we switched it down to economy, then we're not competing with many other hotels. And yeah. that's how we were able to succeed in that market. Nice, nice. No, I mean, that's, that's, uh, I mean, you make it sound simple, but I know it's a lot harder than that. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. So, um, just when, when somebody's looking at, a, uh, I know somebody might be listening to this and they say, mm -hmm. well, daggone, I've been thinking about the hotel industry. You know, what is the one mistake that they should try to avoid when they buy their first deal? So they, they have to know everything they can about the industry. I think you have to be knowledgeable on exactly what the industry is going on because honestly, looking at multifam, if you're looking at a seven cap at, on a multifam, that's a really good deal. But you can't have the same mindset going into the hotel industry and buy something at nine cap because that's yeah. not a good deal uh, right. depending on what brand it is. Um, I think cap rate is very important. And also you have to have a good team around you. And that knows what you have to do and you have to be dedicated. Uh, if you're in, then you have to be in hundred percent unless you're investing with someone who's going to be running the hotel, then you're okay. But if you're the one taking, putting on the hat and working every day, you have to know exactly what to do. And even joining an association like a HOA, um, yeah. where we do like 200 webinars and it can be as simple as how to hire or fire someone. And it goes, Com complex on how to refinance the deal. So yeah. things like that, you have to know and use an association as a resource and learn. I always feel that you can never stop learning. Even if you're 70, you should always be keen yeah. to learning more. Yeah. So uh, that's my motto and we'll continue to live by that. Right, right. Now I was looking at a deal before um, and it's, I see something that they're called a, a PIP improvement plan. Yep. You know, a yeah. property improvement plan. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just you know, tell the listeners what that is and why, you know, they should be paying attention to that? Yeah, absolutely. So anytime you buy a hotel and if it's a franchise hotel, 
the brand is going to require you to do some sort of changes or improvements to the building. And it can be as simple as changing the curtains or changing the bed sheets or something like that. Or it can go all the way into making structural changes. So you have to know what that's going to be before uh, you exit the due diligence. Because when you're in due diligence period and you have, you can get your money back uh, that you've invested as earnest money. Yep. That's what the key is, is knowing what the PIP is, how much it's going to cost and factoring that into the deal and then looking at the deal to see it's going to make sense or not. Because you can easily buy a property for $3 million, but if the renovation on that property is over, a, over 1 million, then you have to make sure that it can sustain that much um, on your mortgage because obviously yeah. you're going to get a loan for the, another million. And you also have to make sure that the bank is willing to give you that loan on the Yeah. Bank. Yeah. Yeah. Now uh, on the multifamily side, you know, the bank like to see a 1.25 debt service coverage ratio. Mm -hmm. is, is it the same thing in yeah, the hotel? It's, yeah, it's similar. Uh, you're looking about 1.25 to 1.7. Again, the hotel industry is very volatile and yeah. that's why even our interest rates are much higher than multifamily. And, um, because a bridge loan in a multifamily, you're looking at around four or five percent. For us, you're looking at eleven or twelve percent. Wow. And along with there are so many other fees that you have to pay. So you also have to make sure that you know what kind of financing you're gonna get. And as soon as you should have your financing lined up before the due diligence period ends, because yeah. you don't want to be uh, losing out on your earnest earnest money that you put down unless you have a financing contingency in play, right. which we, we always like to have on our deals just in case we can get financing. Yeah. 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 No, that, that, I mean, that's, that's really good advice there. Really good mm -hmm. advice. Um, all right, man. So let's, let's go ahead and segue to the next segment of the show. Um, you know, we're going to do talk about a deep dive on a deal you did. Um, you know, where were, I guess, uh, you don't really have to tell where it was at, you know, because some, somebody might be looking at it, but, uh, you know, how many units it was, uh, what was the value add and, you know, what kind of debt you mm -hmm. put on it? Yeah. So let's see. Um, all right. So there was a hotel that we purchased. It was 107 rooms. We bought it for $30 million. And um, we, because of that, we did, we had to do an SBA loan. And the down payment we put down was about, 500 or 600,000 within four or five years, you were able to get all of our down payment back in form of profits. And, and then we were able to refinance that hotel into a CMBS loan. Yeah. So what a CMBS loan, um, there's no recourse on you and it's hard to get, but if the property is performing on CMBS, they do more uh, LTV instead of LTC. Yeah. So the value of the hotel was then, at 4.8 million and we were able to pull out more than 1.2 out of the property. So not only did we get everything back, what we had, right. we were in the hotel for basically $0 in without wow. any recourse on our name. And on top, we still own the hotel and we got over a million dollars in cash. So yeah. that's what you want to look for Right. is what can you improve in the hotel? How can your revenue go up? Even your, if your revenue goes up by a hundred thousand, that's if you look at it three times multiplier, your value goes up by 300,000. Right. And that's what your goal should be to refinance, take everything you put out of your pocket back in your pocket. And yeah. now you're playing with $0 in the hotel yeah. and you still own the hotel. So yeah. sometimes that may make a better sense than selling the hotel because yeah. if there is no recourse, then why do you want to sell the hotel? Just take the proceeds and you can still use it for whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, I mean that you guys are doing the birth strategy where you buy, renovate, uh, mm -hmm. uh, rent it out, refinance and repeat, you yeah. know, that's exactly yeah, what exactly. it is. Man. But you guys are doing it on the hotel <laughs> level. So that's, that's pretty incredible, man. It really is. And CMBS is much harder um, in hotels, especially you probably cannot even get a CMBS loan for economy hotel um, because they want to make sure the asset um, is good in value and that therefore they prefer something in mid scale or upper mid scale. And of course, yeah. luxury. 
So, yeah. um, yeah, it's hard and you have to be, you have to prove yourself right. to, in order to get a CMBS loan where right. they look at your resume, they look at your bio, what you've done, your previous deals that you've done and so yep. on. And yep. it's very hard to get. And if you're not an experienced hotel, you uh, there's a high likelihood you're not going to get that. Or right. there's a high likelihood that you won't get any sort of financing to put them, pull the money back out in your pocket. Right. Banks are okay to refinance, but they're not okay to pull money out the deal. Yeah. So that's gotcha. also one thing to note when it comes gotcha. to hotels. Yeah, yeah, that's that's um that's interesting. Now let's talk about just for a moment, man. What was the actual value add that you um you seen on a property? Like what, what was it that you did? Did you go in and re uh, renovate all the rooms or was it just mm-hmm. your cosmetic outside? What was it? So when you talk about value add, when it comes to a hotel, hotels usually do not trade at a price per key compared to multifam. Yeah. Hotels generally trade on revenue. So what can you do to increase your revenue? Yeah. Uh, that's what we look at. And if you have to bring in someone in sales and maybe a higher expense, but you know you're going to get a better ROI when it comes to value. Yeah. So what can I do at my hotel that will attract more guests? Right. And from owning multiple hotels, one thing we've noticed, if your room is not renovated, that's completely okay, but it has to be clean. Yeah. Guest has to feel comfortable. As long as you give them a good bed and a good shower, and of course a TV, that's all the guest cares about. Majority of your guests, like yeah. I personally, um, I probably stayed in about 150 ho- hotel room nights last year. Yeah. And I, I probably turned on the TV 10 times or used the pools 10 times or yeah. less than 10 times. So you shouldn't focus or money on that. You need to focus on how can you bring business in your hotel. And if it requires you to do a renovation, then okay, do the renovation. Yeah. If, if you can prove that you can get a higher rate just by doing a renovation, then that's what you should do. Right. If you know that you can get $10 higher for a hotel room you rent by doing the renovation, then you look at how much your cost is going to be yeah. and then see how much revenue you're going to pull out uh, because of that. And it's not a simple answer because the market also has a huge factor to play. Yeah, yeah. No, that's um, that's interesting, man. Like, so that's a, that's a big difference between multifamily and hotels, then, yep. because you know, multifamily, you, you you're going in and you know you need to renovate to to get mm-hmm. rents higher. Whereas with you guys, it can just be you know management, you know, changing out the management team mm-hmm. to run the property more efficient, which will increase yep. revenue. So Absolutely. that's uh, that's interesting, man. It really is. Yep. It can even be as simple as changing your name. If you have an economy hotel uh, doing few light cosmetic work and changing the name and bringing a better team in, yeah. uh, that itself will give you a higher ADR. And you can call it a boutique hotel. And uh, if your rooms are old, um, give them a good bed, good shower. Yeah. And that's yeah. all that matters. And as yeah. long as the location and you're, you have a good team around you, right. make the guests feel welcome at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think if you live on site or if you're there every single day as an owner, that definitely helps because you can yeah. connect with the guest. You can tell them your story and that's what a guest wants, a good story. Right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, now, what what kind of uh, exit strategy do you guys go in to deal with? Is it, I'm going to hold everyone or I'm going to add value and exit? What are you guys thinking? See, one thing I feel is you should never be attached to an asset. Um, it doesn't, it's not, I'm not doing justice to my investors and our partners if I'm attached to the hotel. Yeah. If you feel that you're getting a good deal, um, two out of our five hotels that we've recently sold uh, weren't even on list on the market. Someone just came up to us and asked us, hey, would you be interested in selling? And we were like, yep. yes, that's fine. And we go through with the sale depending on the price. So there's not an exact answer. Um, in multifamily, you're looking at around three or five year, uh, hold, but in a hotel, if you can refinance within two years and get a non-recourse loan and able to pull money out, 
at that point, there is no reason for you to sell. Then you yeah. just hold on to that asset because you're in it for negative um, uh, because you already got everything back right. and you're getting additional on top. Yeah. So the answer is it depends uh, on the location <laughs> gotcha. and gotcha. what kind of financing you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that makes sense. It makes sense, man. Um, all right, man, let's go ahead and segue to the last segment of the show. So lightning around five questions for you. Okay. <laughs> all right, here we go. What's the best advice you've ever been given? Oh, uh, not to do everything yourself. You cannot be the smartest person uh, in your team. Uh, or you, you shouldn't be the smartest person in your team. Right. You need a team that excels in every single area. I'm not the best one at cleaning rooms. I'm not the best one at doing front desk. I'm not the best one at managing the hotel. But I think that's what makes a good team. Um, right. Build a good team around you. Yeah, yeah. And if, you, if you're trying to build your team, get, it, get involved with your whole organization. Right, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what, what's the best book you've ever read? I think What It Takes uh, is a good book that I recently read. And it was about the story of Blackstone. And yeah. um, when I read that, uh, I can relate to it because it is our industry right. and the struggles that they went through. And I, I can see that uh, happening in our industry. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, what are some rituals that you've created that's making you a better inverse, uh, investor or person in general? Okay. Rituals. Uh, having communication is key. Uh, make sure you're communicating with your teams um, on a daily or even a weekly basis. When you lose contact with a team member, they don't feel the same anymore. Yeah. They don't feel invested in the hotel or your company. One thing I've learned is appreciation is key uh, when it comes to management and having team members. And there is even a study that more people, majority of the people would rather have appreciation than a pay raise. So um, I think, a, a ritual can be communication and appreciation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that's that's a very good point. Um, what is one thing you're doing right now to help you improve your business? Okay, uh, to help me improve right now, obviously because of COVID, and I've seen how hotel industry is going. I'm also looking at other industries like multifam on how can we implement some of that into our industry. And it can be as simple as, can I convert my hotel to a multifam? And we're looking at assets now, which may be a good fit for a multifam. And uh, looking at that, I'm, I'm just learning new things every day when it comes to multifam. And that's where you can help me in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll definitely help you out there. Yeah. Um, all right, no, last question for you. If you can give your younger self one tip in regards to investing, what would that be? In regards to investing, um, don't get attached to an asset. I've, yeah. I've done that before and we've learned. Um, yeah. Our ROI wasn't as high as it could be if right. we exited uh, earlier than that. Yeah. So yeah, and also trust your team and you're not the smartest one in the team. Just yeah. know that. <laughs> right, right, good good stuff, man. Yep. All right, well, Neil, man, we're at the end of the show here. Um, Appreciate you coming on today. You added a ton of value to the listeners. Um, you know, how, how can someone get in touch with you if they want to um, learn more about the hotel industry or AHOA? Yeah, they can find me on LinkedIn and Neil Patel. And my company name is Blue Chip Hotels. And my email address is listed. It's Neil, N-E-A-L, at bluechiphotels.com. And, of course, they can also go on AHOA's website, A-A-H-O-A.com. And, um, they can also get us in contact uh, that way with us. Awesome. Awesome. Well, appreciate you coming on the show today. Uh, I know you added a lot of value to the listeners. Uh, and you know, until next time, man. Of course. Thank you, Bill. All right. Thank you for listening to the Generational Wealth Through Commercial Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by Onyx Capital Investments. Onyx Capital Investments works with investors nationwide to invest in income-producing real estate in emerging markets. Connect online at www.onyxcapitalinvestments.com to learn more about what we are doing. If we have added value to your life, please leave us a review.